supposed to age. It's cross trained. Yeah. You and DCS, yeah. the probation officers and family case managers. Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started this morning. We have a rather full agenda and some important things to discuss. So um, I will just start by saying that most of you probably are aware that today in history in 1944, D Day, the Normandy invasion occurred. Um, but you may not know that in 1933, today in history, the very first drive in theater moves. Uh, movie theater opened in Hensock in New Jersey. So as we do introductions today, I'd like to hear either the last movie you saw at a drive-in theater or your favorite movie. Mark, would you like to start? All right. Well, I wish I could say that last time I went to a drive-in theater had good movies because it was a, a mediocre double feature at best. I think the I think it was Ocean's 8 and uh, one of the Ghostbusters movies back to back. So and not one of the good ones, not one of the good ones, you know, the only good one. So but that was in uh, upstate Michigan, where I, I realized after letting my car run for six hours to watch the movie that the battery was very dead and was two in the morning. So super fun. <laughs> also, Mark Fairchild Children's Commission. <laughs> Uh, Leslie Dunn, um, IOCS. Uh, the last one I remember seeing was Herbie. So that shows you how old I am. That was a long time ago. Um, not my favorite one. It's just the last one I remember seeing. Great. Matt Alzma, Indiana University. Nice to see you all. The last one was a fundraiser for my son's high school, Heron High School at Tibbs. And it was Bill and Ted's, the latest one. Wasn't that great? But it was a fun experience. Nicole Phillips, Bartholomew County Probation. I I know I've seen a movie at the drive-in theater, but it's been a long time and I don't remember what it was. So as far as favorite movie, um, it's hard, probably Grease. It's been my favorite since I was five. I have no favorite movie. I, I like a lot of movies, but uh, the last time I went and saw a movie at the drive-in was would have been while I was doing an internship out in California and it was an Adam Sandler flop, Little Nicky. And please don't watch that movie. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Darren Dolahanny. Uh, it says Wayne Spirit 3, but uh, that's not that's a lie. <laughs> I'm a free agent now. Um we had a drive-in theater in our basically across the across the road from our backyard growing up. So we saw a lot of free movies with no sound thanks to binoculars i think the most the last one i saw that was an actual movie that we went in our car and had the speaker on the phone was rocky horror picture show by my recollection mm -hmm. um, i'm marshall broadwell i'm not in marion superior seven 16 i'm in marion superior seven right now um i can't remember the last time i went to what i saw there's one not far from me but I think maybe every time we've gone, it's been bad movies and then I've fallen asleep. So I can't remember the last one I saw the drive-in. Um, my favorite movie changes a lot. I think right now it's Alien. So. Uh, Stephen Balco with the Indiana Department of Education. Um, I think the last drive-in movie I saw might have been at church and I don't remember what they were playing with um, my son. So that was probably the last one I went to. Um, my favorite movie changes depending on the day and what I've seen most recently. Um, any number of sports movies, uh, would be good. So. Dana Kenworthy, Court of Appeals. And I probably was on a blanket next to Leslie because I saw Herbie Goes Bananas. That's oh, the last one I remember. <laughs> Ryan Kendrick, we circuit court. Favorite movie, uh, Shawshank Redemption, Andy Dufresne, can't go wrong there. Um, as far as drive-in movies, they were kind of going out when I was coming in. So don't, I, I know that we showed that I saw Star Wars, one of them, and I fell asleep. So, <laughs> My name's Jade Palin. I'm from the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute. And the last time I was at a drive-in was in Valparaiso, Indiana, and it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is really going to age me. I was there with my my son, who's grown and married and has a child of his own now. So, um, And favorite movie is The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. Huh? 
Good morning. My name is Nancy Weaver. I'm the director of youth justice at the Indiana Office of Court Services. Um, I do not remember the movie that I last was at a drive-in to see, but my favorite movie of all time is Primal Fear. You might want to scoot down, Cirilla. But... DMHA. <laughs> 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 Um, I just enjoy our movies, so it just depends. I cannot remember when the last time I went to a drive-in movie. I just remember as a kid having on pajamas and being in the back of the car. Larry Decker, uh, Indiana Department of Correction, uh, Division of Youth Services. I'm with Cirilla. I have no idea when the last time I went to a drive-in movie. I'm sure I was a teenager and I wasn't there for the movie. So <laughs> <laughs> you know we all know it's not act like we don't. Uh, anyway, um uh, my favorite movie is any movie I watch with my grandchildren because I absolutely love their reaction to all of them. So the last one we watched recently was It. And he and I both cried. So um excellent, excellent. Uh, Carolyn Foley, Allen Superior Court, and the last movie I saw at the local drive-in was Deathly Hallows 2 with my kids. Yeah. All right, do we have anyone online today? Don't think so. All right, you have in your packets minutes from April 4th. Do we have any edits to the minutes or discussion? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Magistrate Foley. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Minutes are approved. We're going to jump into probably our, our longest discussion today, and that is the grants update. So I'm going to ask uh, Jade, if you would, go ahead and give that update and then we'll have some discussion around the questions. Okay. So uh, round one of the grants, uh, which were uh, to begin on January 1, um, most of those are awarded and executed fully within the state system. Um, we are waiting on signatures from a couple sub grantees. And we also had a couple of folks who needed to do some budget modifications. So we're working with them on that. We've had um, some folks who have been a little slow to respond, but um, they all have full-time jobs outside of grant writing and working on grants. So they're working on things with our division. Uh, with, uh, I think also the Office of Court Services have provided some technical assistance to folks and will continue to do so. We've had some staffing changes within our division. We lost three of our grant managers, with, which left us with only one. So that also um, was not real helpful to get things moving as quickly as we needed them to be. Uh, but we're moving in a good direction. We've gotten two new folks hired. And so um, that will help speed up. And one of them was previously an employee in a different division at CJI. So that will help. She has grant experience and state experience. So um, she's been a big help for us. Round two, um, the grants were opened and closed and scored. And the grants committee met and went over the applications and made recommendations for round two of funding. And those will go to our full board of trustees on the 14th of June. So not this Friday, not tomorrow, but the next Friday. So we will meet and final recommendations and awards will be made. Then we'll start notifying folks about, um, you know, what they were awarded and if they needed some assistance or need to change their budgets or if they were not funded, maybe why they were not funded and what we can do to help them get funding the next time. The approximate ask on the second round was around $2.2 million. Um, the first round was close to that as well. It was about $2 million. So um, we continue to talk at our uh, work group that we have money. We just need to make sure you know we can get it out the door and get it to people who are doing the work. 
So that's kind of a round two update. But when the, the grants committee met, we had two applications, which were from statewide programs. So we had um, an office of port services application and then an application from NAMI. And so um, both of those applications came in and we had lengthy conversation with the group about uh, whether they qualified. And I think there was some information included in memo form to um, the group here regarding kind of uh, what we were seeking guidance on. We were looking for some assistance from this group uh, on whether statewide programs qualified and um, what that would look like because of the formula funding that was set out. Um, you know, counties got a certain amount based on population, and then there were planning grants available. So we had lots of questions, and in the packets that you guys were sent is kind of our request to the full group to help the grants group committee uh, make, a, make a decision on how we're going to fund these state programs, or if we are. And if we are, then where are we going to get the money from, and how are we going to take it out based on the formulas that were created. So um, that's my quick overview. Sure, thank you. <laughs> so Nancy reminded me that um, we're gonna open round three of applications because we have money, as I keep saying and we wanna get it out there helping folks. We're gonna open round three on June 17th. I have created a very aggressive timeline um, to the um, concern of my staff uh, a little bit, but uh, we're gonna open again on the 17th so that we can hit the next board of trustees meeting for our agency, which is the first Friday of September. So it's an aggressive timeline and we will need the, the grants worker to meet again and score applications again, but um, we have it all laid out and uh, that application will be open for four weeks. We have also decided to divide them up. Um, we're learning as we go. So um, originally the first two rounds, we opened three applications, one for diversion, one for alternatives, and then one for behavioral health. As we went through scoring and the work group went through scoring applications, it became very apparent to us that um, planning grants and regular grants for services were very different. And someone who was applying for a planning grant was trying to fill out questions regarding a regular grant that made very little sense to me um, and everyone else. So we have determined that we're going to break it out. And so instead of opening three applications, we're going to open five. And here comes the Jade being aggressive part again. Um, we're going to open one for planning in diversion and one for regular grants. And then in alternatives, we're going to do the same. So that folks who are applying for planning grants actually answer questions appropriate to planning versus um, other questions. So uh, it will really help with scoring and it will really help us figure out the collaboration piece, which has been a big question for the grants work group about how folks are collaborating on these planning grants because a lot of folks are new to grant writing and they're really not, haven't been able to answer the questions about who they're collaborating, whether they're working with JRAC or someone else. And so those will be very clear this next round. And let you take it. Okay. Anyone else on the grants work group or scorers want to weigh in? Okay. So a um, little bit of background. So statute statutes empower this group to create a plan for distribution of the funds. Um, looking at those statutes, and I, I looked at them again this morning, I think there's flexibility in the statutes. And so I'll point to a couple of those. 
first of all, uh, Indiana Code 3145 covers the diversion and community alternatives grants and 3146 applies to the behavioral health grants. Each of those uh, statutes indicates that the um, CJI in, in collaboration with the YJOC essentially sets the funding formula. So, you know, this group makes those determinations. Secondly, I would note that uh, Indiana Code 3145 three, let me get there, excuse me, four, allows the Criminal Justice Institute to use the diversion slash community alternatives grants to support co and coordinate data collection. And I mentioned that particular subsection because the uh, IOCS grant application is specifically for statewide data collection. Um, and I would note as well that all of these statutes and our charge from the legislature was to ensure that the state is engaged in evidence-based uh, research-backed programming. So uh, data collection is required. The state has to report on that. And so at least upon my reading, especially that subsection that I point to, I believe that diversion and community alternatives clearly um, would allow administrative um, support for data collection. And I think that's probably why court services selected diversion um, to apply within that category. I, I also think that the behavioral health pot of money has flexibility because it indicates that CJI may consider the programs and activities identified for possible funding in the YJOC's report, but doesn't need to solely rely on that report. So I think there's flexibility in a couple of places within the statutes. So I think that means this group really needs to discuss how do we approach these statewide uh, applications. The, the, um, can you give me a ballpark on the amount of money for IOCS? $800,000. Okay, and NAMI was smaller, correct? Uh, NAMI was $18,182. Okay. So NAMI was asking for, is asking for funding to plan uh, to provide system mapping services to counties. Is that a good synopsis? So those counties who are out there uh, wondering what exists within their communities for diversion community alternatives, someone who can come in and help provide that technical assistance to the county to do that system mapping. So that's what NAMI is asking for. Um, and then court services is asking for uh, support to build up a data collection, a statewide data collection for juvenile data. And that's the biggest recommendation from this whole, this whole process. So um, it's important that we figure out how we not only answer these grant applications, but also what if we get additional statewide applications and how do we allocate funding from the three pots of money? This group established a quarter of the money in each of the diversion and community alternatives grant pots and half the money in the behavioral health um, pot of money. So that's sort of how we started in the breakdown. What we're finding with the formula funding uh, standard that we've set is that we've had a very small number of counties apply. I asked court services to provide a, a heat map for the juvenile judges conference next week. So judges have a visual of what money is still on the table and the state is largely green, meaning go get the money. It's, it's still there for you. Um, and so I think the possibility of us having hundred percent participation from every County is unlikely. So uh, we're very likely to have additional dollars on the table, even within those community alternatives and diversion pots. So those are my thoughts and sort of analysis of the issue, but I definitely wanna hear from all of you about what you think about this process and how we should address these statewide applications. Judge Kim, Lindy, can mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I wanna add, if we did an analysis regarding the finances and um, if every county took a planning grant and their maximum allowable amount, that still leaves approximately 280 
to $300,000 on the table. Um, so that is an option in diversion and alternatives. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there. So you're not taking 800 from one pot. <laughs> um, but then, you know, there's money and behavioral health as well. So mm -hmm. just wanted to throw that out there, that there's a little bit of extra wiggle room. Another alternative, rather than taking all of it from one pot, is to divide among the pots of money, since the data collection system would assist in all of the efforts across the state. So whatever that breakdown is, we could, we could determine that. I mean, just thinking broadly, I mean, it, the court services, um, that's an administrative, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think must have kind of situation. Um, and I look at some of the, the statutes too, and just looking at you know the set the, the statute that sets up this board two five thirty six nine point three. It, it indicates that statewide juvenile justice oversight bodies shall develop a plan to collect and report statewide juvenile justice data. Mm -hmm. I mean that's like the first, that's like right out of the box. Um, and then as part of that subsection C, it says determine the cost of collecting or reporting the data described in the subsection. So I mean that seems to me like something that needs to be developed um, and for whatever reason hasn't been I guess up until this point and you know I missed last year so I don't know if there's a reason for that uh, it not being developed there or if there was something specific or a, you know a reason given by I don't know the powers that be whether that be the legislature or someone else um, or we just kind of said hey Let's jump into the great funding. These are very attractive things, the shiny things, and everybody started grabbing towards them, you know, and that's where we're at. But it seems to me like we're almost on step two when we haven't really addressed step one. Mm -hmm. right. That's what it looks to me like, you know, just from a very broad perspective. Obviously, court services, that's an administrative benefit to me as a trial court judge, most specifically. Um, so I would think that I don't know what that formula looks like, but the data needs to be collected. So then the real question, as I see it, is how do we make that determination? And first, I think it should, should most appropriately come from all three buckets, um, being uh, the diversion, the alternatives, as well as the behavioral health, because all of those buckets are going to benefit from the administrative costs associated therewith. Um, and... I guess that's really where we're at, but that, that's my thoughts on it from, from a high level. Secondly, I guess with the juvenile justice conference coming up next week, you know, I think we're going to have maybe better visibility, you know, because from my perspective, you know, I'm also looking as a, as a, you know, a small county judge, who's going to, who's going to get involved in this from a small county perspective, right? You know, and and speaking also even more broadly than that, as it relates to the alternatives and as it relates to the diversion, I mean, some of this has been going on for years. I mean, especially when you go back to JDAI, right? I mean, but some of this has been going on for years. So I think you know, if it's probably time that we make the determination who's going to look at those options. Um, but to be fair, I think maybe maybe one of our best determinations going forward could be this conference coming up next week, at least from my perspective. I think that might. Well, and then there could be counties such as us where, you know, given that we looked at JDAI and dealt with the diversion on that front and dealt with the alternatives on that front and through their funding, are, are we going to be looking at using the funding so much that was provided by YJOC? sitting here right now, I can, not really. You know, that's why we went for the behavioral health fund, right? Because we'd already kind of done that. <laughs> so that's probably money that's just going to be setting on the table that honestly is probably not ever going to uh, get requested. Mm -hmm. But that's my thoughts. Someone else want to jump in? I just said, I was getting ready to try to look this up, but maybe someone in here knows the answer more readily than I do. Um, what was the plan for the funding of the juvenile justice data collection that was proposed in the final report that was included last year? Was it, <clears throat> I was sure that IOCS was going to be in charge of doing that, but 
Was there any discussion in the report as far as, far as funding mechanisms? There was, so there was a lot written in the report about next steps in terms of piloting five sites and getting data from multiple sites. So that was really in depth and there's a recommendation for funding to be available to make that happen, but not necessarily a recommendation about how to get the funds to make that happen. Okay. So the plan is detailed. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and we're kind of in a holding pattern until that those funds are kind of identified. Yeah, because looking at other, you know, data collection, uh, as Judge King pointed out, was one of the primary, if not the primary focus of some of our work. If you look in this, the statute that creates this body, it's subsection A underneath it. The very first one is create a plan for data collection. Uh, and I think it, it supports every single piece of our other efforts and you know supports the rural counties that are at a disadvantage and supports the big counties who have the resources but we need to know what they're actually doing with those resources so it's it's definitely intertwined with every facet of our our work um so i'm i'm very much in favor that we need to tap into this money for that data collection it's it seems appropriate <laughs> And going one step uh, backward, further backward, I will say, uh, when I started with this group in November, I went back and pulled all of the old juvenile uh, summit reports that I could find. And going back to the mid 2000s, data was on the list of recommendations for ever from every one of those reports, but it's just never happened. And so I think that's largely why our legislature is saying, let's get it done. And I think this group can get it done. Um, at this point with this funding that's on the table. So I think what I'm hearing is a consensus around the table that data is important and we should figure out how to allocate the funding for this particular um, data application. Is that a fair assessment of the room? Does someone want to throw out an idea for allocation or Dr. Osma? Just one yes. clarification. So my colleagues actually showed the final report that I helped draft. And point number seven specifically talks about funding, some upfront costs to really pilot, understand data quality. And then there is a need for ongoing costs to continue that work. So I think this is important right now to really get that process moving, but then going forward, I think that'll be another thing for our committee to really re is to consider is where should those funds be available going forward to make this a really high quality, true data process. So, verification, please go on. Appreciate it. I was thinking too, you would want a project manager mm -hmm. to be over this, to make sure all the parts are being tracked. And then that would require the group to do an RFP mm -hmm. and look exactly what you need for that data project for implementation. Yeah. Because that's a big lift. So you would want someone who doesn't already have a full-time job to provide that interest. So whatever that cost would be. Yeah. You're saying for the ongoing or for the initial or for both? For the initial, for the ongoing, to be able to map that out and give us an idea <clears throat> how long each phase is going to take mm -hmm. in the cost. So are you suggesting that um, we open a specific RFP just for statewide data collection and then ask for applications and not rule on the one that we have, not make a decision on the one that we have? That's no. worse, Mark. I, I guess I, I, just because I have the report up yeah. front of me, so... Good. It does specifically talk about how the legislation dictates it's uh, the Office of Judicial Administration's role under which would go IOCS and then gives some financial recommendations. I think it's 500,000 upfront and 2 million over each uh, biennium ongoing. So it does state that it goes under Office of Judicial Administration would be the data collection entity. Under that umbrella. Judge, I have a couple of concerns, I guess, before we 
let this go too far downstream. I mean, it doesn't, we don't have our legislative partners with us today to tell us, but it doesn't feel like the intent of the money they appropriated for these grants is to provide for data collection by office support services. That's our judicial administration. It just doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand we have a rich pot of money and very few people have dipped their cup into it. And so there's all this money, let's do something with it. Hey, look, here's a great project. I totally get that. But, but it doesn't feel like that meets the spirit of the money that was allocated. I'm not sure, no, because the, the memo didn't disclose who the applicants were and knowing that one of them with a, with a big ask are people that directly, as Ryan pointed out, benefit a lot of the people at the table. I have a hard time discussing the, the uh, appropriateness of us making that decision for them to be allowed to apply uh, for funds that I'm less than sure are meant for that type of a purpose. Does that make sense? I, in part, at least, when it comes mm -hmm. in front of the IJC's board, which, which I'm lucky to serve on, I'm going to have to talk to our ethics people about whether or not I should abstain from any vote on that. I don't know if that drips down to this level of discussion mm -hmm. either, Judge, but it gives me pause uh, for, for me and a lot of my colleagues here at the table. Okay. So how could we get those questions answered for you? I think Jade's group could be of assistance to us and... Um, Adrian's team. Okay. And um, Wendy, or somebody from mm -hmm. the legislature that was very close. Mm -hmm. I did meet with her yesterday and give her an update, invited her to the, the co-chairs meetings. I'm not sure if that'll be on her calendar or not, but I'm, I'm making those efforts to get our legislature uh, folks to, to participate in the meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In light of the concerns, would it make sense to have our grants uh, work group perhaps hold another meeting specifically on this issue alone? Uh, invite our two legislative representatives to the table there, along with perhaps Adrian uh, Myring from the uh, ethics side of things at Court Services to talk through these issues. Would that make sense to move the ball forward? So at this point, based on a CJI standpoint, um, most of you don't know, but our process is uh, our staff make recommendations to a subcommittee of our board, and then our uh, subcommittee takes that information to our full board of trustees. So at this point, we have deferred the two state applications. So basically, um, we let our subcommittee of our board know that there were applications, but that the YJOC work group had deferred those applications pending conversations here, and that, um, you know, depending on what would happen today, we may or may not move them forward and they could just kind of sit out there as being deferred. So that's that's an option. Then the next meeting would be in September where the full board would or could vote, yes or no. So just that gives a little heads up on the timeline. Okay, thoughts from the group about that, Joel? Well, we haven't really talked much about the, uh, the smaller ask, the NAMI ask. And uh, one thing that's been running through my mind is could we ask them to pre-identify counties with that they want to work with in order to do this mapping? And maybe that way, once they have the identifiable counties that they're working with, then we can know how to allot the proportion of the funds that they've been requested, that have been requested. I, I think that's a good point, uh, Joel, because the juvenile um, detention or excuse me, diversion and community alternatives pots of money require collaboration with the local uh, juvenile stakeholders. 
some of the applications were missing that piece of information. Um, the behavioral health, not so much because that's a competitive grant. So we're not asking them to show, you know, collaboration with every local uh, juvenile stakeholder body in the state. Um, I think it would make sense, especially if we're awarding diversion or a community alternatives grant for system mapping that they say we plan to do this in these five counties and these five counties want these services. Um, because to fund system map mapping in general and then and then not have any takers would seem to be um, an irresponsible use of the of the money. So I I think that's a good idea, Joel. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? So for the NAMI uh, pot of money, what I'm hearing is if we have statewide asks from diversion or community alternatives that will ask for indication that they've collaborated with County X and County X's stakeholders are on board with this. Is that, does that sum up what you said, Joel? Yeah, I think that that okay. sounds very fair. Okay. Do you wanna make that in the form of a motion? Uh, sure. <laughs> 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 so moved. Um, <laughs> so I move that statewide applications that tap into the uh, diversion and community alternatives funding identify specific counties that they intend to work with so that the proportion of funds can be properly allocated to those counties through the grant process. And just to add to that, and I think consistent with the statutes, and my thought is that would be best embodied by the juvenile court judge signing that they're going to work with NAMI to provide this information. You know, so that's the signature, my read of, of the statutes, is that they would need. You know, could, yeah, could be. Other, otherwise, yes. what's that mean? You know, who are you working with yeah. in that county and how, what sort of benefits that going to have? You know, I think at least, you know, if 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 it's embodied and, and shown by the juvenile court judge saying, yes, this is a worthwhile program in my county, then I think that speaks, at least to me, and I'm probably biased, mm -hmm. uh, but it would go to show that this is something that you really consider, um, and, you, and you think it's a worthwhile program, and, and you plan on using it um, as part of the justice system. And I think that's a detail. I think it's consistent with what Joel's recommendation is, uh, but isn't that essentially kind of probably the best uh, practice there? Yeah, I, th I think that works for counties where there's one juvenile judicial officer. Um, in counties where there are more than one, we have had a little, little bit of a challenge where we've had funding already allocated for a program in a certain county. And now we've got another application in, from the same pot of money with a different juvenile judge's signature on, on a letter. And so the question is, are those systems communicating with one another within the, the larger county? So a little bit of a wrinkle. Um, Just pay juvenile court judges. <laughs> But under the formula grant, if, if Judge 1's pr preferred program has already been allocated the funding, then Judge 2's program's not going to have the funding available. So that was the one wrinkle I'll that we had. That. <laughs> Thank goodness. I second Joel's motion. Yes. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Further discussion on that motion? Leslie? Judge Kimberly, I'm not on the commission, but it, can I provide some background? Please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I do know that there were discussions previously with Representative McNamara about initial funding being provided to OJA because we have uh, we run Odyssey and also the Insight applications, so they would have to be the entity that modified those forms and made the changes and collected the data because that's what they do now statutorily. So really, they're the only ones that can do this. So the, the discussions were to have money up front to start that process, maybe create the forms, but then there would still have to be a long-term funding source for like research and other things. And that was something we were going to take to the legislature. But I know there were discussions and there was support for the short-term funding, that original pot to get things moving. So 
and, and in fact, there's two reports that are required by the legislature now um, that LJA has to present annually that we don't have that data. We can't collect it. We have no way to collect it. Um, our team will have to develop a new form, a new process to be able to get that to comply with the law. And so uh, I think the funds were intended for that, what we've already been asked to do, which is develop the plan, develop these new forms and that kind of thing. And I know Lisa Thompson, I think is here and she also knows a lot about that. So that's what the original, that ask is for, is to start that process because otherwise they're stagnated. They can't do anything um, and they can't even comply with you know, completing the the um, the ask for this certain data they want. Um, and like I said, then I do think later that the long term money for ongoing research is something that they may have to fund a different way long term. That's my understanding. And those are conversations I was a part of with um, Representative McNamara for to the extent that's helpful. Thank you, Leslie. So work group regarding data, we'll take that into consideration. Nancy. Um, Yes, ma'am. I don't know how this impacts the motion pending. Um, however, I was thinking about the where um, Judge Kenworthy, you talked about 3145, three and four maybe, um, where CJI has um, the ability to use some funding for administrative support for data collection. Mm -hmm. And my thought went to, because this kind of adds to, um, what Leslie said, the early conversations that I recall and was a part of was that potentially um, CJI would designate some of those funds that could then be um, through, uh, I'm not going to use the right language, not an MOU, but a um, transfer to Office of Judicial Administration um, that it wouldn't, that it is, is it directly in compliance with what CJI is required uh, is allowed to do, but then is gives the ability to do that. So um, I'm also I'm thinking about is it even necessary for the Office of Judicial Administration or Court Services um, to submit an application if that is something that is allowed in the statute? Um, maybe it's it's through that mechanism and not even an application for the themselves. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and that statute's 3145-4-A-3, specifically the data collection portion of the statute. Um, but again, it, that's back to the data question. I think um, there's enough unease at the table that we need to get that question answered um, decisively rather than guessing at what our legislators intend. So I, th I think there would be some comfort level to have the, le the legislators at the table for that conversation. So we'll make every effort to get, to get that done. Um, and then switching back to the uh, other statewide asks and the motion that's on the table. Is there any further discussion regarding um, that discussion? No further discussion I would have is just what my previous statements. Mm -hmm. And because I think it would be something that I would be interested in, but I would hate to think well, who's doing it in my county, and I don't have any information right. uh, relative to this, or you know, so I'd at least to have to have some judicial buy-in. Now, like you say, I, that could look different in a larger county or with multiple ju juvenile courts, but you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess at that point, maybe it gets messy. Um, but then you're also dealing with like the, the, the situation where if the funds have already been used, to me, that's kind of a different issue than it is as to whether the the county is even interested. I mean, maybe the funds have been used, but you could still say, well, I, I'd be interested in being part of this um, and seeking funds another route, or, you know, because that's what, what a lot of this discussion has been about mm -hmm. so far. Um, it's something a little bit different than the 37.5 or plus 10 or whatever. So mm -hmm. that's the only thoughts I have. Okay. So the motion, uh Statewide asks, we would expect in the diversion or community alternatives pots of money that the applicant would provide indication that there is partnership with the juvenile justice stakeholders, whether that's a judge or a greater portion of the stakeholders within a particular county for that application to be considered. There's second for that motion. I'd second the motion. 
I think we had a second over here, Judge Dolahanty. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed nay. I can abstain. Okay. Thank you, Jade. So we have an answer for half of your, your memo requests and we'll work on the other half. Is that fair? Okay. Any other discussion regarding the grants work group activities today? I threw in enough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was a lot of work, Jay. Thank you. And I would say that CJI has been working, uh, Renee and Renee's back here as well too, um, overtime on technical assistance for applicants, a lot of webinars, um, a lot of Q&A. They will be attending our juvenile judges conference next week in person to answer questions of potential applicants. And so um, to the extent this group can support Jade and her team as they continue this work going forward, um, we should do that and we appreciate them. All right, Mark, you want to move on to commission update? Sure. Um, and, and I am really glad that we've been able to be a part of this as we get into the implementation phase of everything YJOC is doing. And, and we're happy to be at the table and look at how we can assist with that. So sounds like a lot of the questions today are just as we're building the machine and figuring out how it's going to run. So I think we're on good track there. Um, just a few things from the commission that uh, at least dovetail into YJOC that I want to talk about today. Um, a couple of small items, um, just make sure it's on your radar as we look at specific initiatives. Um, we have under the Children's Commission formed a new subcommittee that's going to be looking at early childhood mental health. Um, we've got our chairs in place for that. So Courtney Hopp with the uh, Early Learning Advisory Committee and Steve Aywig with everything mental health in the state of Indiana, because I've run into them everywhere. Uh, we'll be heading that up, but looking at that early childhood capacity, so think three years and younger where there's a real absence. Um, but as we get into things with some of the problem solving courts, safe baby courts and things like that, um, and even some of the services that relate to parents in that space, that's an area that the Children's Commission is going to dedicate a little time and energy along with all of our partners at DMHA and the early learning uh, community that's out there. So we can see that there's room where that's going to become um, some justice involved families as well. So just be aware that um, if you're looking to work in that space, we do have a, a home to do some of that. Um, we also just formed a new task force on uh, bullying prevention, suicide prevention, digital well-being, and online safety. Um, again, there's plenty of that that will kind of dovetail into some of the initiatives we're looking at here as we're pulling things together. Um, and that's going to be uh, co-chaired through DMHA with Michelle Bullington, who runs our suicide response for the state, um, and with Department of Education bringing in some, pro um, some uh, project-aware folks there as well that work in the school. So um, more of just an awareness thing that we have some work we're doing in that space. So if you have initiatives that fit in with that or you want to be part of that discussion at that end, uh, just let me know. Um, there's always room for more worker bees in this particular hive, so we know we've got a lot to do there. Um, now, more specific to YJOC, um, we, over the last month, were awarded a technical assistance grant. Um, the Children's Commission, um, along with partnership with um, a few state agencies, DMHA, Department of Health, and Department of Education. Um, and this is uh, one that's based on building out our state's capacity to work cooperatively between agencies and youth and families with lived experience. Um, talk, we have obviously had a lot of talk with YGSC about how we're going to build that capacity for working folks with lived experience, um, how we can do that better, and how we can keep building that out. So when this opportunity came up, both the Children's Commission and YGLC have been very actively involved in that space. Um, this is a national effort. There are five states that were chosen nationally, and we were happy to be one of them, um, led by a group called the Forum for Youth Investment. There'll be a national launch convening at the end of July. We'll have representation from those state agencies, Children's Commission, um, and then our quickest to respond and want to be involved were actually the youth in this case, um, and our one parent partner coming along on that journey as well. Um, what's noteworthy is that we had discussions about what we would be working on, what specific issues they would like to form solutions around, um, and they gravitated towards uh, chronic absenteeism and truancy. Um, it's a space that definitely has become elevated. It's 
uh, post pandemic, I think we kind of hoped everything would settle back to normal and it definitely did not. Um, there's a lot of discussion to have in that space and there's a lot missing on the end of youth and parent voices. Um, is is the discussion there. And also the way that we knew that we had picked the right topic was the youth were clamoring to be involved on that discussion, talk about their health, mental health, school safety issues, what keeps school from being a place where um, they are willing or wanting or feel safe attending. So that project will go on for three years. Um, so that group will be kind of the core incubator of some policy ideas and thoughts, but also be working closely with um, the Children's Commission. We have a status offense uh, subcommittee um, actually under Nancy's uh, task force. Um, and then of course we have our diversion work group within the YJOC. Um, so for Office of Court Services, I did tap uh, Megan Horton, who's worked on both of those camps as, as a good overlap there. Um, but I know we have tons of people um, working on this status fence range right now when we know when we look at those truancy um, and runaway are kind of the highest uh, preponderance of, of numbers that we've seen across the state there and truancy is almost always at the front end of that. So um, if you're wanting to get more involved on that, there's a seven person travel team that's allocated by our grant request that we put in there. But we know we've got about a thousand more partners around the state that will want to be involved in tailoring solutions. Um, especially now that we have a long-term window to do that. And we do have some legislative support on board as well through the commission. So um, again, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to be part of that initiative um, or just at least be on the list of updates coming through that as we go forward. So those are the big ones for me, other than um, I, I think uh, Judge Kenworthy and I will be kicking off the conference uh, next week. So looking forward to that and providing some more updates and hopefully getting even more buy-in on all the work that we're doing here. Questions for Mark? I, I do want to emphasize the truancy issue for a couple of reasons. One is that the uh, Indiana Supreme Court and Court of Appeals judges travel around the state for district meetings with trial court judges. And that was a theme this year. One of the themes that we continued to hear from the trial judges that truancy is just out of control and we don't know what to do about it. Um, I think schools are are much in the same boat. And then a couple of weeks ago, I spent, Mark and I spent part of our Saturday with uh, Indiana Youth Leadership Academy and Cirilla was there, um, spent, spent the day with some very bright young people. And one of their chosen issues was also truancy. And I thought that was very interesting. So um, they're set up in pairs of two. The, the young person who is in their second year mentors the young person in the first year and they and they discuss issues and uh, develop a voice for the system. And uh, one of our table discussions, I had a couple of duos of, of young people and the truancy issue was very important. So safety, I think is a given. That's one reason why they don't go to school. They're afraid for some reason or another. Another is they're bored or don't find the instruction relevant. Another is uh, a, a young man said, you know, adults just assume we're lazy or we're dumb because we don't go to school, but some of us have jobs because we have families to support or we have younger siblings or we have children ourselves. And so we have to go earn some money to support our families. Um, and a, a couple of the young people, one said during COVID, my parents were on me to do all of my work all the time. And he was really annoyed by this. Uh, that he had to do all of his work and did all of his work. And the young man next to him, his mentor said not so much for him. So he didn't really do all of his work and, and skated during COVID and their outcome, same school was the same. So the message that they've received is that if we do the work, we get the same outcome as my friend who doesn't do the work. And so what's the point of doing the work? And I thought that was really interesting and not something that I'd heard before. Um, and one of the young young ladies at my table talked about mental health supports in school, how they need more for that, uh, more help in the school setting, and not just the students, but their teachers need the same supports as the students. And I, I thought that was very insightful as well. So I think they're a, they're a very, very much untapped resource. Cirilla, anything you want to add from that day? No, I was just very impressed and uh, very appreciative of your 
ability to want to share their experiences and, you know, just to talk about being afraid to leave their house or where they live because of the shooting and violence that's happening and how school is not a safe place anymore. And they wish they would have a caring adult in a school setting because when they're having issues at home, they don't have someone to go to it at school. Mark, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I think it just reinforced for us that these aren't kids trying to shop excuses or anything. They have very valid reasons and they care and they care deeply. Um, I think one thing that was was said by one and all is we're right here, we're talking, we just need people to listen to what we're saying and do something with it. And they're right. Everything they said made sense. And it wasn't self-serving, like I said, reach out and saying, hey, can somebody be looking after our teachers because we're worried about them? That tells you this is not self-serving dialogue here, right? They they want their schools to be a better place and they want people to listen to them. Um, so I think we're excited to be part of just creating more of a space where youth voices are really heard, where they're elevated. And um, we'll be looking at events we do over the next year through the Children's Commission about how can we work with them to make sure they know how to share their stories strategically in the right places and fully supported so they are respected when they speak up because I think we all want to see that. Any other questions for Mark? All right, moving on to our other work groups. First up is screening and assessment. I'm doing a report today because Michelle and Shannon are both gone. So okay. um, we met on April 12th, but we canceled the May work group meeting to allow more time for some more substantial work to take place. Um, we've outlined some topics for the key reminders and the work group chair and co-chair provided it to Judge Kenworthy uh, for final approval. The approved memo and attachments are included in the work group report, and these were provided via the following communication methods in a weekly uh, message to judicial officers on May 8th, email distribution to chief probation officers, which included a request to provide to all can juvenile can probation you, I'm sorry, can you use the microphone, yes. please? I'm sorry. Um, an email distribution to chief probation officers, which included a request to provide it to all juvenile probation officers, um, and that went out on May 8th. And then the Justice Services Conference on May 8th through the 10th uh, had sessions for IAS skill booster, predispositional report writing, and updates and overview to the juvenile probation standards. This was also communi communicated by an announcement within the conference app. Um, we have one active subgroup working on recommendation number five with the Office of Court Technology to update the standard preliminary inquiry report form. The subgroup recently attended the probation officer's advisory board to provide them with an overview of the work and receive two volunteers to join the subgroup to aid in building the requirements. Once the requirements are prepared, they will pre be presented to the work group and probation officer's advisory board before proceeding to the next level of review and approval. And we have our next work group meeting scheduled for Friday, July 26th at 1.30. Questions, questions for Nicole? Is the, is the PI revamped just specific to JD cases or can that spread over to the chin Um It is just specific to JD cases, but what it does is allows for multiple assessment tools to be included in the dropdown in the PI report. Um, so it's include you could include an IAS diversion tool and a detention tool. Right now, it only allows you to select one. Um, so it's really related to JD cases. You would like to see that on the chin side, I'm gathering? Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Along with the PDR. Okay. I think perhaps we can get that to the right work group. Other questions for Nicole? Thank you. All right. Next up is behavioral health. Sorella or Judge Dolahanty. He's pointing to me, so it would be me. Um, we held two committee meetings on April 4th and May 29th. Uh, as chairs, we met with both Nick and Mindy ahead of both the meetings to plan our agenda. To keep our goals front and center, we will remind the group that the main goals for the behavioral health work group are as follows, that local counties develop and adopt plan and policies 
regarding the use of court order diagnostic or psychological assessments, expanding the use of telehealth for mental health services and diagnostic or psychological assessments, use of the multidisciplinary team model for high acuity U. Um, I asked um, for a collection of diagnostic assessments, received them from DOC uh, and DCS, and we requested also DNEs from our community mental health centers to look at kind of the content and information, to look at the testing results, and so we can compare uh, the reports with the real world uh, standards. Uh, ahead of the meeting, we also met with uh, Waylon James from DCS and Zoe France, and we talked about the distribution of the assessments, but we also looked at DCS standards. They have a 22-page standards for diagnostic evaluations. Um, and so we spent some time comparing and reviewing those reports. Uh, we also had a dynamic discussion on what the DNA bench card for judges and magistrates might look like. Do you want to comment? Oh, it was great. I mean, it was <laughs> great. Dr. Quinger down on her knees, like writing all over a chart. And it, was, it was great conversation. So I think what we're doing is really looking at a bench card that can be simple for judges to use in quadrants and really went into discussions about what information and the type of information is needed for those bench cards uh, so they can be used. Uh, the goal is also once we have a sample is to get that out and get comment and feedback um, to the other judges, public defenders, probation, to see what's adequate. I think what we have learned from our discussions is where are the gaps in communications between when we have probation and DCS and how do we know who's already had testing done or evaluations and learn that certain tests and evaluations, if you've done them within a certain period of time, you really shouldn't be repeating those. So I thought that we uh, received a lot of good information on that. Uh, we initially had talked about inviting Dr. Pinnell and David Reed to talk about the high acuity group, but we delayed that because we have a lot more work to do with the bench cards and looking at the DNDs. Um, at this point, we don't have any subgroups, but I'm anticipating we may have once we get the bigger uh, projects under tell that we will need someone to look at doing developing surveys, getting results back about um, the documents and tools, especially for me, the diagnostic assessments. And that's why I told Matt, um, I wanted to speak with him because there's 27 different assessments. Mm -hmm. And really we want to be able to identify which ones really are gonna have relevance for the judges, what is gonna make the difference? What is it that you really wanna know, not just for judges, for public defenders, for probation as well. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think once we get that bench card submitted in the draft for the diagnostic assessments, we'll be sending um, that around to the comments in the first part. Questions or comments for Cirilla or Judge Dolahanty? We are, Terry, really trying to take into account the whether there is a necessity to send children to you for diagnostics mm -hmm. and if, if it can be avoided, if it should be avoided, or if it can be avoided, or two different seem to be two different paths. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's been a, that's been throughout the discussion that that comes up. Is there someplace else that we could do this that would not potentially be as traumatic for the child? Mm 
in as much as a, a strain on your resources mm -hmm. as well. What, what we keep coming back to is you do too good of a job. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard that. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm working on it. Back it up. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. No, I think we also know the duplication of information and it, the testing component as we are talking about telehealth and could some of this be done, well, the testing assessments that are being done by the, by the psychologists are being done tell right, right, <laughs> is the truth. And so looking at it, is that something we can have in the communities? But issues have come up like workforce and can we pay enough? And can they meet all the standards DCS has in place? And rather than being freelance, they could probably make one. Dr. Alsman, did you want to add something? I mean, all the issues you just stated are the issues workforce, payment, telehealth. I mean, so you're hitting all the right ones. Go get them. But there are best practices out there, you know, so I think that's the other thing to kind of make sure, not just the DCS side, but on the research side, too. So so I, when we get to that point, uh, I'm working on a list of all of those assessments that are being used from all the different reports, because all the reports are different, so you're going to get different information. Yeah. It would be really good to, to touch base with your group and look at those as well. We have the benefit of Nick and Mindy being with us today as well, and they've been uh, contributors in the in the work group, Doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and and for everybody's benefit, one of the one of the bigger spots Joel's been involved as much as anybody too. Mm -hmm. One of, one of the big areas that we, I say, stumbled across. Some people already knew this, but I did not. Is that there's a wealth of reported information available on a lot of these kids already that doesn't come to our attention. Mm -hmm. Doesn't come to what we get comes from probation. So if the probation officers don't know what's out there, we don't know what's out there is the honest truth. And and it's it seems like there are, for many kids, reports that the Department of Child Services has access to that nobody bothers to say, hey, do you have something we could look at? So that's that's been one of the one of the more eye-opening parts too. So when when we're structuring this bench card, bench cards kind of become a, a project of its own. Uh, but but for me, it may not look this way when we get a finished product, is we're asking the the, the standard reported questions, who, what, when, where, why, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? And to, and to help guide judges on, do they want this? Why do they want it? What are they getting out of it? What are they not going to get out of it? Where should they send the kid to get the best product? And then other factors that they want to take into consideration as well. So that's kind of what the goal is driving this, this bench card, is to give some guidance we, we haven't really touched on the numbers two and three uh, recommendations. And that's why I, I joined heartily with, with uh, Cirilla's assessment. We're probably going to be setting up some subgroups pretty soon to get that work moving forward as well. Other questions or discussion regarding behavioral health? All right. Next step, diversion. Do we have, uh, Megan, uh, there she is, Megan's yeah. here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Megan Horton. I'm the co-chair for the diversion work group. Tracy Fitz, our chairperson is unable to be here today. So I will provide our report. Um, our group met on May 29th. Um, uh, one of our First focus areas for this year was to develop a diversion resource guide or toolkit for um, new count or counties who are looking to implement a new diversion program. That was provided to you all back in April and um, for feedback, and that has since been completed. It is now on the YGOC website, um, so it's available for use by counties. There is also uh, an email address, so if counties have questions or would like some additional information, they can uh, use that email address and get some more information around diversion programming. Our second area of focus has been to um, 
work on uh, compiling information around diversion programs being implemented around the state. So finding out what counties are doing and being able to put that all together in some sort of directory or resource that counties can use if they're interested in learning about programs that are currently being utilized. Um, so we have discussed that and spent a lot of time figuring out our path forward there. We have a lot of information that we've received from counties around programs being used. Um, we had done a, a kind of a wide scale survey that we administered a few years ago when um, our diversion group was an offshoot of the Children's Commission, Juvenile Justice, and cross system Youth Task Force. So um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're going to start with the information we have, um, knowing that some of that will need to be updated. So we are going to start putting that together um, into an actual format and document. Um, we may have a draft of that for the next meeting of this group. We'll see. Um, and then we will spend some time doing some outreach to counties, uh, getting updates, making sure all that information is is current. Um, we identified the pieces of information we want to include. I don't know that we need any guidance from this group yet. Um, in the short term, we're planning to just develop that as a document. Um, however, we've talked a lot about what we would like to see that be as some sort of searchable, web-based, um, something, uh, uh, yeah, dashboard, something that counties could use um, to be able to look up different programs based on different needs. So if they're looking at county size or type of program or target population. So I think that's something that's a longer term goal. So I think that's something that we will probably need um, some guidance from this from this group on uh, in the future. The last of our kind of focus areas for this year was, um, well, however we might partner with or support um, the grants group in diversion grants um, and, and supporting counties or um, wherever that uh, may be needed. And so one suggestion from our group at our meeting last week was um, to potentially collaborate with the grants group to host some virtual meetings or some kind of office hours or some um, support for counties that are considering applying or looking for planning grants or diversion grants, whether they've applied, they want to apply, or they just want to talk to each other about troubleshooting. So um, I think we'll want to explore that with the grants group, but that was that was a suggestion um, that that group had, and potentially that it could be something ongoing if those counties want to talk to each other and do any sort of peer-to-peer um, -peer discussion about those. Uh, we've had some new members join. We have um, Judge Evans from Harrison County and Judge Lee from Knox County have joined our group, and we are in the process of reaching out to some other um, individuals. We are looking for some law enforcement and education um, representatives. And also we really would like a youth representative on the group. So any questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Megan. And finally, Terry and Magistrate Foley, Transitional Services. Good morning. Um, our group met April the 4th. Uh, we began the meeting with uh, a Zoom focus group with the select group of judges uh, where we asked about considerations um, that they make when they are committing youth to DYS. We also asked them about resuming jurisdiction. Um, just as a plug, we also had wonderful feedback from them about the great work that my staff do. Um, so that, it was so nice to hear true. We're, we're working hard. Um, we uh, created subgroups at that meeting as well. Uh, we have a subgroup for best practice, one for service standards and one for uh, the state agency collaboration. We didn't meet as a big group in May because the subgroups met in May. So we have a meeting today, uh, this afternoon where the subgroups will be um, reporting out. Um, let's see. We've been asked uh, to present also at the judge, judges uh, conference and are very excited about that. So Magistrate Foley will do a, a bit about um, probation standards. Um, I am presenting on BYS, uh, the data and the programming and several other things. And then we will finish with a little bit about our transition group. So we're excited to be there. I think that's it. Nope, I think you pretty much covered it. Questions regarding transitional services? Okay. 
All right, so that concludes our work group reports. And as per our practice of the last couple of meetings, I'd like to just go around the table and open the floor for conversation. Dr. Alsma, before we do that. Well, and, and just one clarification on the data work group, there's not a report out as we didn't meet for this last time. Mm -hmm. We do have an update though. We do have a new co-chair. So Chris, Court Services, thank you for being in this role. So we're looking forward to moving that forward. And just for clarity, I'm super thankful for the robust discussion about funding around data to make sure that we're doing it well and sustainable and ethically done. So thanks for that work group and look forward to how we can all get this moving well. So that's the report out over. Thank you, Dr. Alsma. Yeah. All right, now open floor discussion. So I will just go around the table and ask if there's anything any of you have on your mind for the good of the group and would like to discuss here. I'll start on this side of the table this time. Unfortunately, I don't I don't have anything. Nor do I. Uh, I will just say that in um, um, our team role in the Office of Court Services, we are fielding a lot of requests for technical assistance from um, counties um, around some of the things that are they're, they're becoming aware of in terms of 1359. So we are very excited about that. Um, we have we've set up a meeting in a couple of weeks with like a six county group down in southern, almost southwestern. We're kind of dipping our toe into the southwestern part of the state. Um, and our team is very, very excited about being able to support counties in um, doing the work that is required under 1359. And um, they're a great group of counties. They're they're doing good stuff down there. Nothing for me. No? Joel will speak on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everybody's holding back because I'm sure yeah. everyone in here has things to share. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to a lot of great training opportunities. You know, we have the JDAI Intersight Conference coming up. My people, the Juvenile Defenders, have the Galt Center Summit coming up around that same time. Uh, OJJDP is doing a 50-year celebration of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. There's a lot of great uh, things. I'm trying to plan a dual status uh, training for all of the stakeholders that will be in this room and then have some breakouts. So there's there's a lot of people who are digging in and doing a lot of good work. So I, I appreciate everyone for having that attitude of trying to make things better and learn more. I'm thankful for summer. <laughs> can you just clarify for the minutes jade is the nami statewide grant is that being deferred and on hold as well i wasn't sure or is that going forward if they identify the counties the work group deferred them and so my assumption would be that they are deferred until we have the meeting with the legislators but i don't want to speak for everyone so I will let Judge Kenworthy pitch in. Well, I think that the legislators are going to weigh in on the data. Okay. I think our motion and second uh, passed regarding the other statewide requests and community alternatives and diversion. And that is that they need to show that there's a partnership with X counties um, in order to draw funding for those particular pots of money. So it would be, I think, an amended application would be needed from NAMI. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Leslie? Thank you. Mark? Uh, well, I'm at the end, so I don't have anybody to defer to, so I'll just second for yay summer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think uh, we have lunch coming. Do you know an ETA on lunch? It's here. Okay. All right. So those of you who uh, ordered lunch, we can break bread together here. And otherwise, our next meeting will be August 1st. And we are adjourned. Shannon called me on the way out. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you.